Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to APS webinars. The title of today's webinar is The Many Faces of Industry, and this is the third in our Success in Industry Career series. I'm Crystal Bailey, and I'll be your host for today's broadcast. Thank you all so much for joining us. APS webinars are brought to you as a service of the American Physical Society, connecting you with the expertise of individuals who can offer insight into physics careers, educational programs, and professional development for students, working physicists, and educators. Um, quick word about why to become an APS member if you're not already one. APS membership gives you easy access to valuable career information and resources, like this webinar, for example. Um, membership allows you to get your research out to the community and network with potential employers or colleagues at our meetings and have a greater positive impact about issues that are important to you through grassroots advocacy. APS membership can also help connect you to a community of like-minded folks through participation in our forums, divisions, and topical groups. If you are not yet an APS member, but value the things that APS provides, we would encourage you to consider joining today. Um, we'll introduce our wonderful speakers in a second. I'm very excited uh, about our panelists today, but I do wanna do a little bit of housekeeping first if you're new to Zoom. Um, so I'm going to kick off uh, the discussion today with a few prepared questions, but then the rest of the time that we have together will be for you to ask questions. Um, so if you would like to ask a question, please type it into the Q&A panel, which you can access by clicking that Q&A button on the bottom right hand side of your Zoom screen. Um, you can submit questions at any time through this panel and we will do the best we can to address all of them during the broadcast. You can also access audio settings and other things through this audio settings uh, button on the lower left-hand corner of your Zoom screen. Um, this recording, the, this presentation will be recorded and a link will be sent to you following today's event. We do ask that you give us about 48 hours to process that video and make sure that it, it looks good before we send it to you. Um, there will also be a survey that launches at the end of this broadcast please take a moment to give us feedback uh, through that survey so that we can uh, continue to improve our ability to provide you with these valuable services. And lastly, before we dive in, I also wanna mention there are a couple broadcasts coming up that are part of our Success in Industry Careers series. On October 27th, we've got a broadcast coming up on specific communication skills that are important in a private sector environment. And on November 17th, we'll learn more about what successful teamwork really looks like uh, in practice in a private sector environment. We also have a great webinar coming up on October 29th, which is in two days, I believe. No, in a couple of weeks. <laughs> um, about careers in medical physics use, uh, featuring Dr. Julianne pollard Larkin. You will not want to miss these great discussions. So if you haven't already done so, please sign up on our main webinars mailing list using the link shown. Um, you, at the, you can see at the bottom right hand side, there are different kinds of themes that you can sign up for if you're interested in. Um, you can also find out information about these broadcasts on the main uh, webinars page, which is linked at the bottom. Okay, now with all of those announcements over with, I'd like to introduce our panelists. So we have Ophir Garcia Salazar, who's with Raytheon. Ophir's educational background is atomic, molecular, and optical, or AMO physics. Uh, and he built an ultra-cold atom laboratory from inception for Bose-Einstein condensate experiments. He has significant expertise with lasers, optical alignment, optomechanics, and optoelectronic instrumentation. During Ophir's time in industry, he's worked on development and analysis for multiple airborne and space applications using sequential optimization non-sequential ray tracing, and stray light analysis. His analysis work often includes the use of tools like ZMEX, Code V, FRED, CREO, and MATLAB, and is often accompanied with laboratory verification with actual hardware. Other responsibilities that he has involve report generation and presentations to customers. Ophir has a background with small firms as well on small R&D government funded programs for multiple optical related technologies. In doing tech development for the government, Ophir gained experience with multiple idea generation stages, proposal writing, contract awards, and management of programs from a business and product development approach. Um, Jennifer Hobbs started off working uh, research as an undergrad and early grad student working on Minerva at Fermilab. 
and then switched into computational neuroscience partway into her PhD. She was first exposed to machine learning toward the end of her PhD by helping another student in the lab. She started some computer vision work after another student in the lab refused to do an error propagation study on an experiment her group was working on, so she decided to automate everything. She had always intended to stay in academia because she loved teaching and was actively involved in other elements of academic life, but realized uh, that the academic path had too many constraints and uncertainties going forward, so decided to make the jump out. Though she was originally in a more traditional data science role at a commercial insurance company, she has since transitioned into more applied machine learning uh, research roles since then. Currently, she is the director of machine learning at Intel and Air, an ag tech startup. And I realize I misspelled that on the slide, sorry. Her team uses computer vision and machine learning to detect patterns and alert farmers to issues in their fields like weeds, nutrient deficiencies, and emergence issues. So that's really cool. Um, Rock Mackey. Uh, Rock was a U University of Wisconsin-Madison professor of medical physics for 25 years and is now an emeritus professor. Rock is a seasoned entrepreneur. Uh, during his academic life, he started and continued to assist in the growth of spin-off companies with one becoming a public company. Since Rock retired, he has started several more companies that promote academic entrepreneurship at the University of Wisconsin and in the region. And Heike Real is an IBM fellow and head of science and technology of IBM research, responsible for research, a research agenda aiming at scientific and technological breakthroughs in quantum technologies, physics of artificial intelligence, nanoscience and nanotechnology, including IoT and that's Internet of Things and health applications and exploring new directions to computing. She studied physics and math in Germany uh, and joined IBM Research after an internship with HP Labs in Palo Alto. She's an expert in nanotechnology and nanosciences and focuses her research on advancing the frontiers of information technology through the physical sciences. Her research has contributed to advancements in OLED display technology, molecular, molecular electronics, and semiconductor nanoscale materials and devices. Her recent research interests include topical states for quantum information processing. And Heike also just received the honor of becoming an APS fellow in 2020. So thank you panelists for joining us. And I think I'm just gonna dive into some questions. Um, so audience, the way this is gonna work is basically anytime anybody is speaking, you're gonna mainly just see their, their face. And at any point, please feel free to type in questions. Okay, and this is going to be to the panel. Uh, please weigh in everybody. Um, we know that to be successful in industry careers, physics graduates use a combination of technical skills and knowledge that they gained while getting their physics degree. We hear this all the time. And there may be some skills that they actually did not gain uh, in, in addition to those scientific and technical skills. Can you talk specifically though about the scientific and technical skills that are important to success in your career path? So just raise your hand if you wanna go first and I'll call on you. Anyone? I mean, the one good thing about uh, uh, the one good thing about being a physicist is that we have deep, um, deep analytical skills that I think are really important for a company. And in fact, uh, you know, Silicon Valley was founded by physical scientists. Uh, uh, you know, going back to uh, Hewlett and Packard in, in the '30s, but you know, Shockley going um, to Stanford and uh, and bringing a bunch of people from uh, Bell Labs with him. And then they started Fairchild Semiconductor and a couple of those uh, folks, Gordon Moore um, uh, and others starting um, Intel. And you know, there's, there's hundreds of companies that are in Silicon Valley started by physical scientists. So this is the, this is, we, we uh, embody uh, in many ways um, the analytic skills to really uh, be creative uh, and see what's missing. Um, and, uh, and of course, have a deep uh, knowledge of technology that, um, you know, is, is what a new high tech company is all about. Um, Heike, I see you unmuting. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm happy to add on this because I think, um, I mean, physics is a broad field, right? You can go in many different disciplines, but I think what's really the basis for all the physics topics you may choose later on is that you have a very good theoretical base also. 
uh, and this is grounded also in the math. So uh, math, physics, and also a bit of chemistry. I think that all sets you up for a great career in different topics, whether this is in optics or semiconductors or quantum physics, or um, I think it's very broad. And so you have to have, of course, I think also the passion and the motivation to do though. Uh, and um, the prerequisite for, for excelling is that you like what you do. And I think that's why we're all in because we like the math, we like the natural sciences, we like the physics, the chemistry and the combination and solving technical things, right? In the end, solving uh, problems, technical problems by new innovative solutions. And uh, then we have the fun to go to the lab to do all these things, uh, use instruments uh, to solve these problems. And I think this passion and um, yeah, and and um, and attitude to do these things, and that we really like what we are doing, is in the end what makes uh, someone excel in this career. Absolutely, um, Jennifer. Do you want to talk specifically about uh, some of the scientific or technical skills that that you use every day? Sure. So, I mean, my, you know, my path's a little bit different, obviously starting in, you know, in high energy, then moving into more of like a neuroscience and now doing a lot of machine learning, computer vision. Um, and, and certainly on like on the theory side, uh, I think, you know, physicists, one of the reasons there's now so many physicists in the machine learning community is we kind of just look at it and say, well, this is stat map, this is thermo, this is field theory. It all kind of maps back to a lot of the, the theoretical underpinnings that, that we had, um, you know, during, you know, the classwork. But I think also there's a, a bit of an irony, which is obviously, you know, machine learning sits usually in computer science, but um, many of the physicists um, are as good, if not better at writing code than a lot of the computer science students are, because especially if they worked on an international collaboration like in HEP or maybe in astronomy, um, you know, they had to write code as a part of their research, they had to write code that they were gonna ha hand off to somebody who might not speak their primary language. And, um, and so there's, you know, maybe it doesn't have necessarily the rigor of, of um, some, some areas in, in software development, but in some ways it's actually actually more. And so there's a lot of the, the technical coding skills that I think, um, you know, which, which isn't maybe necessarily a part of the physics curriculum, but that if you're doing research, you pick up that way, uh, I think is kind of an added bonus that, that a lot of us have. Absolutely. I just will say that in, in my experience, uh, look, looking at the broad, range of skills that are, are useful that are scientific or technical. Coding and being able to program is absolutely uh, essential <laughs> in almost any route that anyone with a physics degree would go. Ophir. There we go. Got to figure out how to mean. Yeah, I, I want to also add um, and sort of where a first gentleman who uh, shared some ideas about the physical scientists starting in, you know within industry and really setting off big major sort of industrial aspects of, of modern society, I suppose. But same here in Southern California too, even though I'm, you know, I feel like I'm still fairly young compared to some of my colleagues, not in a bad way. I don't mean that I quite in the opposite and that you see here in the Southern California, as far as the aerospace industry goes, you know, uh, Raytheon who used to be a uh, Hughes aircraft, uh, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman. I mean, the, just you name it, uh, Boeing, all, all these um, companies, you know, uh, have hire a lot of physicists for different dif different aspects of their R and D as well in the defense side. Um, just as a little, uh, maybe it's a small detail, but I think it says a lot at the same time. Is like here at Raytheon, which used to be Hughes Aircraft, you know, even though you know I work in the optical engineering design. Uh, aspect of of the of the daily you know work that's done here in in, in El Segundo, um, the fact that all of us are our title are physics engineers. There's there's no you know we're technically optical engineers and designers, but the emphasis I think it's a legacy that shows that there's a deep appreciation for the fact that you don't necessarily have to be an engineer or you don't necessarily have to be this and that. You know what really matters is the is the know-how of the physical science, and then you can branch out and do whatever it is that is needed for the task. And of course, you have to specialize. I'm not diminishing that because it's highly specialized. Yeah, yeah. but at the same time, uh, it's the it's the it's the ability 
uh, I think there's a recognition that if physicists and mathematicians and people who are in the physical sciences have the tools to kind of know how to learn as well. I think that's a point that uh, that sometimes gets overlooked and that I think all of us have learned, you know, the value of like, you know, picking up a book and, you know, even if you're not an expert in that, you can very quickly digest and get to the point of, okay, how do I write some code quickly that does this? How do I quickly learn this other piece of software that does that? And, and look at it, not from a purely like a tool, like some, sometimes I don't want to disrespect engineers. That's not my point, but sometimes engineers fall a little bit prey of like, what does the tool do? Well, but I think physicists take a little bit different approach of, well, let's understand the tool as far as the fundamental aspects of what it can do and what it can't do. And the essence is kind of the physics behind it. Uh, and therefore that can give you the insight of how to solve certain problems, certain things. And that, that, that goes a very long way. So just wanted to add that. Helen. Yeah, no, that's a very, that's an extremely important point that, that we are, we have the ability to be those kinds of generalists and, and have kind of outside the box thinking when it comes to solving problems. And I, I would yeah. add that it's not just our scientific and technical skills, it's our, it's confidence. I feel like physics, physicists have a certain confidence that maybe, yeah. maybe not every discipline does in that regard. Um, yeah. yeah. So great. Oh, yeah. There's one other thing too, which I think you know, uh, physicists do really well is the ability to understand experimental design as well as measurements. I think a lot of times, like you see, um, you know, people from other disciplines. Again, it's a lot about using the tool. I need to I need to use this tool as opposed to being able to break it down and saying I need to understand what's going on. I need to understand what the right experiment, what the right task is, in order to answer the question that lets me move forward. Absolutely, yeah. So, and I think this is a great exploration of, of kind of the scientific and technical skills, but then we also hear from industry folks that there are other skills that serve you day to day in, in private sector environments. I think this is really important for purposes of this panel, right? We want to learn specifically about industry and, and private sector environments. What are skills that you would say maybe you didn't pick up as a physics graduate but that you use regularly and that you would sort of recommend someone build if they were going to pursue a career like yours? Maybe like- I think, I think, I think the most important skill that, that we don't learn in academia uh, or don't teach in academia is, is good project management skills. And, and clearly industry uh, is all about um, scope, schedule and budget. Um, and you really do have to, um, be mindful. In fact, in industry, everybody is, 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 is mindful, whether you're a manager or not, about, about what, what is going into a product, what is um, uh, the needs are, and be highly focused. Whereas in academia, you're almost, you're exploring the world. You're, you're dabbling with this and you're dabbling with that. And, and I sort of uh, view it as uh, the difference between a truck driver going between A and B and a, and a holiday -er. Uh, that is going on a holiday. I mean, they don't, they're not, it, it's, the, it's the journey that's important for the holiday. And so that's a cultural difference that I think um, is missing in academia. Academia, we're just a tad more like industry. And, and in fact, if industry are a tad more like academia and do some exploring, it would be a good thing. Yeah, so I like that analogy. Go yeah, ahead, I, Heike, sorry. You know, if I could add to that, I think that's a, that's a very good description also because um, I mean, in, in the academia, you're really exploring things, right? And, uh, and that's perfectly fine. But I think what, what actually made me go to industry was really that um, you, you have a lot of resources at an industrial research lab available, but you also and you also have a clear purpose and goal you want to achieve and you're working on. And it's not only a paper, right? A paper is, of course, also one purpose, but that uh, is not, not the only one because you want to solve a problem. And this is what you already pointed out. It's kind of the project man management skills of um, what is the scope? What do you want to really achieve? Um, what is the timeline you may be able to achieve it? Um, and plan well of what you want to achieve. This means also more focus then on, you need to you know the direction more clearly and be also faster in reaching that goal. And um, I think that was, was things I really appreciated also when, when joining the industry that there is a clear purpose and, um, 
and then you have a successful achievement in the end, also much faster and quicker, which you can also share with your colleagues and uh, and hopefully also be able to transition to the business unit and 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 bring it into a product. And uh, but there are often also other skills. Um, actually, since I grew up in in Europe, um, where the presentation skills was not were not really part of uh, the university education at my time. I think this now has improved quite a bit. And so we, it was always a um, present, not doing only good work, but also being able to communicate it and to present it well in an easy manner and understand that you have a certain audience in front of and understanding that you may need to change also how you present, what you communicate to the audience you have available and you talk to. I think that was also an important insight um, and learning. And in the end, it's about Jennifer, or, or I think someone pointed out, it's also about gaining confidence in doing those things and uh, getting also tools at hand on, on how to do things well. And I think today that's much better done. Uh, and and um, But that was something I did not get at the university. But uh, I think the question is always also, what do you want to gain at university and what do you gain later? And um, because we often say, oh, you need to come with having all these skills like project management and all these things available or economic understanding and a broader view about the business administration and all things. And I think people, when they study for masters, they should study the basics of the physics and the natural sciences. And then later on during the job, you have a lot of opportunity to do other things, right? Get your masters of business administration or other things, which also help you then expand your skill set in the industry. Um, Ophir, yes, go ahead. There we go. Yeah, I'd like to uh, also add. Uh, this is now maybe a now uh, maybe a little bit the flip side of of that sort of great quality which, which we just discussed which is sort of the, the confidence and the, and the ability to you know feel like you you can learn things quickly and that's all good but there's also there's also a little bit of the flip side of that and and i'll speak for myself i don't know how all of you guys feel but um i remember that one of the things i feel like uh i guess i didn't learn and i learned as, as i went further along is that because i because i worked in a experimental uh, uh physics lab where we built the lab and work with all the lasers and the mirrors and and whatnot and it, it you know you can I, I i personally took on this sort of multi-role of doing multiple things as far dealing with hardware right like you know ordering you know putting the optics assembling quickly doing something making an imaging system for this getting so on and so on and what that did is kind of it made you very efficient at you know kind of picking stuff up but as time went on once i started industry i caught myself having the tendency to want to do everything as well and the reality is, is that in industry, there are specialists and, and you need to pick something where if you're going to, especially if you're going to go on a technical track, uh, like the one, you know, I'm in, you have to really start to hone in your skills in, because it's impossible to do everything. <laughs> That's why you have a team. And that goes into the whole efficiency and the management side. Like, it's okay if you're not the guy who's solving the problem with the operational amplifier, because you know what, there's electrical engineers or physicists or whatever who are working on that if you're going to focus on this one thing then that's what the company wants you to do not because they want to stifle you but because there's an efficiency aspect to that and you're it took me a while to kind of learn that that it's okay i don't i'm not required to solve all the problems for this particular project that's why we have a team of people that's why they have specialists to do this and if you focus on this one thing that you're doing then allow others to shine in other areas and don't feel the necessity to, because you're the physicist you're, and you should know everything and therefore you need to do everything. It's, and so that's a little bit of sort of going the other way. That, mm -hmm. That's all I wanted, kind of learning that ability to kind of let go. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, that's one of the weird things for me, which I was gonna say is the, um, the ability to spend money that, you know, whereas in, in graduate school, I would have gone to the, oh, this is broken. I'm gonna go and take a soldering iron and go fix this. It, you know, they'll just look at me and say, you're, we're paying, we, you know, it's, it's cheaper to just go out and buy it than, than using your time to, to solder this back together. And, oh, okay, really, <laughs> I just it did, we would never have crossed my mind before. I'll actually say, though, on the, um, on the project management side, that's something that gets raised a lot. And I think for me, um, having been, like, when, when I was at Fermilab, you know, we were in the detector 
building phase. And so I saw a lot of that project management firsthand. I mean, I remember sitting through those meetings and like the steel is stuck in Ohio. Okay. Um, now what, you know, and how does that? And so I, I think, I think in that regard, I was fortunate to see maybe an element that's not um, always there. As far as like technical skills, there are certainly, you know, while, um, while I learned a lot, obviously on the coding side in graduate school, there's still the speed at which cloud, you know, cloud tools and that are growing is just so fast. And so you can't learn all of that in graduate school. The, again, the ability to learn is even more important than what you know at a specific point. Um, but certainly, you know, there is that need to pick up a lot of those, you know, new tooling kind of on the fly as it's always developing. Yeah, that, that those are all really great points. And and no fear, you know, it's kind of like, uh, you know, last the last broadcast we had was sort of about uh, return on investment, understanding like the, the, the attitude and, and Rock also hit on this too, the, the attitude. A key cultural difference between academia is that you can basically spend, you know, as much time as you can get funding for frittering away, you know, at, at a very esoteric problem, right? And, and you know, because it's interesting and because it's important and yeah, that's great. But, you know, the idea in industry is that, you know, it is, it is driven by profit. And if, if the company is not profitable, the company goes away and so does your job. So, you know, it's not that hard to support that that perspective, but I think that's another really important point is that you know um, you have to be flexible, right? You have to be willing to sort of work on a problem, and then if someone says, you know what, we're not working on that problem, you need to be ready to go to a different problem. But you know, for some people, that's a that's a feature, not a bug. We have another colleague who uh, is a high energy physicist, but is in uh, the insurance industry, who says she gets bored working on the same thing all the time, and so for her, it's actually um, an advantage. So I, I think the best companies, though, uh, give their employees a, a chance to uh, to play as well. And if you don't, you know, a company is going to stagnate. I, I think a, a good rough number is that, you know, 15 to 20 percent of your time should be spent uh, still exploring because your company needs to come up with radically different products. And if if nobody's encouraged to try new new things in industry, that company ultimately will fail. Absolutely. I think that's a great point as well. You got to have that room for innovation. So there's some great questions coming in. Gosh, where do, where do I start? Well, the first one um, I really like <laughs> is, could you tell us about a time when you failed and what you learned from it? Yeah, I'd be, I'd be happy to talk about uh, a, a failure. So we started a company in a, about 14 years ago, uh, trying to bring the, uh, the dielectric wall accelerator, we licensed some technology from Livermore. And uh, Livermore was pretty convinced that they had it ready to go. And there's no more science to do. You don't want to start a company and do science. You want to start, start a company and do engineering. And uh, unfortunately, there was material science property. So we put about $35 million uh, of, our, of one of our, my companies and, and investor money into it. Um, and, it, and it failed. We did, though, start a, a large industry in China uh, and, uh, working on the dielectric wall accelerator. So at some point, it might uh, end up happening, um, but it probably won't up, uh, up, uh, end up happening here first. Anyone else uh, want to weigh in? on a time you failed and what you learned from it? I think sometimes you have to, I mean, you, you do experiments which fail, right? I mean, that's the nature also sometimes. And, and then you have, I mean, you're naturally learning from these failed experiments. Uh, I think what, one important point is also that um, if you're in research and I'm actually working in research for a company, then you need to also see um, when you have to stop certain research projects, right? We always, uh, it's easy to start new research projects, but um, to, 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 get the, to find the right timing also when you stop something is important. And sometimes this may be a failed experiment, but sometimes it's not. So I think this finding this right uh, moment of when stopping things is an important point. Ophir, go ahead. Yeah, I remember also earlier on when I was still working for a smaller firm, we had a uh, we were working on a, a really neat project um, that was funded by the Department of Homeland Security, and uh, it was making this sort of like a what's it called? Uh, I called it like the CSI in a box. It was basically a, an analyzer that optically analyzed 
uh, DNA traces and with the diff it, it, it involved biochemistry. It was really neat. It involved biochemistry and it basically you tag things and there was a PCR reaction. But my role was designing the optical uh, system for it and, and the optics, the filtering and the lighting. And anyways, but we, we, it was incredible. It was one of the funnest things I've done, but, um, and it worked and it took a lot of, you know, there were obviously pitfalls along the way. And finally, once it started working, um, you know, the funding, you know, the whims of the government changed and, and things, you know, changed around, uh, changed presidents, whatever. And, you know, sometimes it's not even that you fail because of you, it's, that's the way industry is right now. And, and that's it, it's game over. And unless some big investor is willing to come in and save you, then, but you learn that, you know, well, the, the lesson learned is that you don't stop doing things because, you know, there's this sort of guaranteed, you know, you have, I learned, you know, all these things about optics, all these things about developing instrumentation, and that's what you carry with you. You know, maybe it would have been nice that that instrument would have become a bigger thing, you know, and, and maybe, maybe that'll come back. We'll see. I, it's, it's, uh, it's just, you know, you, you, you can't get discouraged by those kinds of things, uh, especially in industry, especially in defense. It's a cycle. Uh, you know, you could be develop, developing something for F-35 one day and then the next, you know, for three years and then the project's canceled and what do you do? So you can't get let that stop you. I mean, you have to find joy in what it is you're doing in the moment, I think, is maybe the lesson learned. <laughs> Um, great points. And I also want to just take a moment to do a tiny bit of housekeeping. So a few of you are, are continuing to submit questions through the chat. Um, could, could, if you could please submit it through the Q&A window, that's where we're pr primarily monitoring for questions. If it go goes into the chat, we may not see it. So um, please put that in. Uh, yeah. And if you want to ask a question, um, just put it in the Q&A panel at the bottom right hand side of the screen. Um, Okay, uh, Jennifer, any any thoughts about the you know uh, failure question? <laughs> no, I, I mean I think the the young thing is is like is the ability of you you can walk away from a project that's maybe what we'd consider incomplete for any number of reasons. Sometimes it just doesn't pan out the way you wanted. Sometimes it's you know not where sales are, not where funding is, and just um, I think a lot of it is to not see that as as a defeat because you know, often it's a lot of these are coming from from external circumstances. Also, just to add something, I don't know if anyone said this, but I mean, failure is kind of built into product development. <laughs> you know, the whole idea behind uh, developing new technologies is that you actually want to fail as many times as possible um, because you're going to, you know, you try something, it fails, you, you learn, right? Um, I think I think that's that's what I understand to typically be the way that a lot of technologies are developed. And so, you know, to the question of what did you learn, I think at least in that specific example, you learn how the thing fails and then you make it better, right? And sure, certainly like that is the ideal way that it would happen. I think at times I've found myself in situations where um, maybe the company is not, uh, doesn't maybe embrace that or understand that. And if you don't have the capacity to fail in your job, like, again, the, there's almost no way to have innovation. Innovation doesn't have 100% batting average um and if if people are expecting uh if people are expecting 100 percent you know success rate you, you're just never going to get anything that kind of moves the needle um yeah cut really quick oh of here and heike follow on and then we'll go to the next yeah just a quick follow and i think and it ties back to the earlier question about kind of what you learned you know it made me think of what i've learned in the now in, in, in industry versus, you know, back in ac academics setting is that one of the things I remember from one of my previous bosses that was really, I think, quite, quite a little bit nugget of wisdom was, you know, fear, you got to learn how to fail fast, especially in industry, because what, what, what happens is that you're constantly solving a problem, trying to do something. And it's good if you fail, because if you if you if you if you start a problem and you and you go through all the solutions and you whatever you're trying to do and you quickly realize that's not going to be a good solution for this or for whatever reason it's just not going to pan out, then we can move on to the next iteration or the next version of whatever it is we're going to do. If you kind of stay fixed on the 100%, then you're you're in this diminishing marginal returns sort of level, 
and you may never get out of there. And the people are waiting and people are like, well, is that going to work? Is that, oh, I don't know. I don't know. Because, but as a, as a scientist, you tend to have that tendency. Well, it's not quite right. It's not, but there's a difference between getting it perfect, getting it quite right and good enough. And that's where industry is different, very different to academia. It's not about perfection. It's not about, do you have this beautiful graph that has the fit to, you know, 30 Sigma way? No, we just need to make sure that this goes on this target. That's it. <laughs> Whether it exceeds it by a hundred fold or by tenfold, it's irrelevant. So I think failing fast to get to that point is it's important. That's all. And, and, that, and that product is called the minimally viable product. And as, as often a launch for uh, for other products that are better right and that's how you succeed is by is by replacing yourself with better products yeah um so I could, you have a quick thing i want yeah, to make sure we get to all the I questions mean, failing me i mean failing you have to analyze why you failed and improve it right and this is also what we do as physicists we analyze and uh fail fast and but also learn fast i think failing two times on the same thing is a bad thing right um so, yeah, you don't want to keep failing in the same way over and over yes, again. Okay. Exactly. You want to, to continue improving. Yeah, that's a great point. So there are a ton of amazing questions coming in. So I'm really trying to kind of figure out how I can, can uh, get as many of them as once. There are some that are coming in that are on a, a general theme that I will respond to. And then if you have something to add, uh, please do. But there's a lot of people asking, okay, well, in general, what advice should I give a student who's interested in an industry career? How do I break through into an industry career? What are the main things that you would advise? A in my job at APS as uh, head of career programs, I give a lot of advice about this and I will quickly give you my suite of, of, of tips. And y'all can chime in if you think this is, is good or bad. Um, and there was someone else who also asked about careers for bachelors in the private sector. And one thing that I didn't show her my statistics. So over half of physics bachelors actually go straight into the workforce and about 70% of those go to work in the private sector. Um, by the way, those bachelor's degrees working in the private sector are typically paid more, especially if they're in a STEM field than a postdoc in a university. So it's very well paying. There's a lot of good career opportunities for bachelors out there, but there's, there's some key differences. You know, a bachelor is gonna be less likely to um, be doing R&D unless they're in a very small company that's kind of a startup and, and is a little bit more agile. Um, but to the question of what you should do, I always say that the thing that you should do if a student is interested in industry careers or you are, is try to, to work your network and do as much exploration as you possibly can, first of all. Um, if you're on LinkedIn, you can look at your first and second degree connections. There are other webinars that have great advice about how to do that. But if you find people that are interesting in your second degree network that you just want to talk to and learn from, schedule a call with them. If you don't know them personally, ask your shared contact for an introduction. Um, go, to, go to meetings, go to virtual meetings, go up to people, ask them if they'd be willing to give, that, give you 30 minutes of their time so you can ask them questions about what they do, what advice they have, what skills that they recommend you build. Tell them who you are, tell them what you're interested in. And if you're getting close to a point where you're actually going to graduate, say, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm gonna graduate in six months. I'm really interested in careers in these companies. If you can do an introduction for me, I'd really appreciate it. You know, um, that's a great way to kind of build up your network. So I would say that that, that would be my number one step is, is go out there and try to do as many informational interviews with as many different people as you can it allows you to learn more than you'd learn from me or from a webinar or from a web page, and it builds your network and adds people who might be useful to you when you're actually ready to start um, pursuing that career. So that's probably my biggest piece of advice. Anything else? Y'all would. Yeah, I mean, most most universities have um, some sort of entrepreneurial clubs uh, or associations um, for for undergraduates or for graduates and even postdocs. Uh, and, and frankly, postdocs and graduate students make really good uh, company founders. And many of these organizations will also teach you entrepreneurial skills, uh, project management skills. So that you learn, learn, for example, what a PL and a balance sheet is and, and some, some rudimentary accounting and finance. Uh, and, the, and the interesting thing is that, is that you'll, you'll be meeting students from other departments besides just physics. Uh, and, and so you'll be broadening your, uh, your uh, horizons as well. So I do definitely encourage people to reach out 
uh, to other folks that want to work for industry that are in academia now. Yeah, I'll just reemphasize the networking. Uh, you know, for for me, you know, leaving graduate school. Um, I was not given a lot of kind of guidance or insight as to like what I could do now that I had this you know, PhD in physics where my background was in high energy and then a little bit in computational neuroscience. The big data science boom had not started yet. Um, and really it was the fact that I knew um, somebody who had been my TA my freshman year who then um, we were out at Fermilab around the same time and she had been very successful in industry. And like I saw that she was you know doing well and enjoying it and I went, well, okay, maybe I'll go down this route too. But I applied, I mean, out of my PhD, I applied to over a hundred places, uh, heard back from three, got an offer from two. Um, and it, you know, because it, in truth, again, like pre, pre data science boom, um, people didn't know what to do with me. And so it was having those connections that made a huge, you know, huge opportunity for me. And one other quick add on thing too. No, I think that's a really great point. And, and I've heard that from other folks before. Like there are a lot of great opportunities in industry, but you have to be prepared to apply to a lot of places and, and, and um, talk to a lot of people and also rely on that network. One other quick thing is someone had written in with a very specific question about their, like the things that they have experience with and what kind of industry career would be good for them. I get questions all the time like, well, I'm a nuclear physicist. What careers are there for me? And I think, we need to shift our basis vectors from what physics subfield am I an ex expert in to what skills do I have? Because regardless of whether you studied astronomy, nuclear, plasma, whatever, chances are you have you have coded, you have done data analysis, you have you know run an oscilloscope, like if you're an experimentalist, for example. So I think it's really important to remember to focus on selling skills rather than like, I know this very specific type of, of subfield of physics. Ophir, did you have something to add? Yeah, I would, I would also add that um, another helpful thing, again, I, I guess in my case, was also kind of not locking yourself in into thinking, oh, I must get this type of job right after school. I mean, I had the also caveat that I wasn't even a U.S. citizen. So, you know, I, I, my options were not great, I would say that. However, being able to say, well, let me work in a, you know, in this environment, you know, and build up my skills and then use that as a jumping board. You know, don't, don't limit yourself that, oh, well, I don't have exactly what I want right away. Like, you know, look for something that's close too. I'm not gonna say go off and do artwork because that's a little bit, that would be a little too out of the way, but, you know, find something. Sometimes you have to find a compromise and then learn as you go. And then, and then that will also, oh, surprisingly, it always opens other doors. It always opens other avenues that lead you into different areas. At least that was my experience. You know, I, like I said, I did AMO physics, but now I'm doing optical design and analysis. And I love it. I, but it, it, you have to be open to kind of getting your foot in the door somewhere and then using that to build up. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Heike, did you have something to add? Yeah, I wanted to add to this because, um, you know, I think for the, the physicists, what bring they to the table is, as you said, right, they have certain skills. And I think the analytical skills are very important. Also the logic thinking they have trained during their education and career, and also the fast thinking. And I think this is something which is valuable in many different areas. And this is why you also find physicists in many different areas, um, whether they are in consulting or whether this, they are in, 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 in insurance math and, and other things, and coding and AI, et cetera. So I think when we look for people, we are also not looking for some, for really, we want to have not only a deep expert, you have to be kind of, we call it T-shape, which means you have to demonstrate a deep expertise in one area, but you also have to have the capability in industry that you are able to switch and to learn other things fast. Because in an industry, I mean, it, it's evolving. You are not choosing your subject of matter like in a, like perhaps at a university where you can stay in this field forever, right? You, you may need, depending on how the industry changes and every industry is changing because you just have to look at this at, at the industry backs, right? Um, you have to change with the industry and be able to even drive it. And so I think when you apply, you have to demonstrate that you can offer these, these skills and abilities. 
Absolutely, yeah. And um, you were, we're also getting a couple of questions, like very specific questions. One thing, one person also asked for tips on things like interviews and how to how to do that well, and also resources like where are jobs posted. So I will quickly share that with those folks. So we did have a webinar presentation from Peter Fisk, who is this absolutely amazing career coach, and he covers in extreme detail um, all of the, the information about every step of the way from self-assessment to uh, applying to jobs, to expanding your network, doing informational interviews, how to do a good interview in, in actually in a job set, like when you're interviewing for a job. So I will try to remember to share that, but it's also on our um, webinar page, but I will try to share that information. Peter Fisk's career in, uh, careers in physics workshop that he did for us. It's a two hour video. It's very informative. Um, to the question of where job postings are, APS does have a job board. It's part of a shared jobs database. So um, if you go to careers.aps.org, you can browse um, for those postings. So we're also getting into some kind of specifics about skills that serve you. So maybe I'll, I'll start um, by asking Jennifer this. Somebody had asked specifically, what skills are good for machine learning or data science? Like what, what, what could people be doing now to prepare themselves? Uh, certainly the you know the coding is is a huge part of it um you know depending on kind of if you're more in a traditional data science role versus more on the kind of ml applied research side there's the um r versus physics war you know if you can pick up a new language it's uh i you know that that doesn't matter i you know i think having you know familiarity with with one you know of those is is good um during the time like as i was graduating before i started um, I was kind of brushing up, you know, I asked the company, like, you know, what are you using was kind of brushing up on those, but also the ability to just, it's going to change, you know, at that point, it looked like Hive was going to be the next big thing. And then Hive is kind of largely gone away right now, not gone away. It's just not what it, it was not, it's not the promise that, that it was, that it was, you know, back, back then. And, um, you know, on the, you know, on the theory side, I mean, certainly, you know, being familiar with the literature, you know, reading the papers, reading what's kind of coming out of these top conferences. Um, but it's amazing what you can kind of pick up quickly. And then I'd say just get your hands on on some projects, particularly for, you know, if you're going outside of your field, or if maybe you're um, a master's or a bachelor's student, you know, who doesn't have, you know, one of the things we look for when we were hiring is like having some kind of body of work some kind of portfolio. And so if you have a PhD, your thesis is your portfolio largely. Um, but if not, you know, put together, find a problem that you think is interesting, you know, and, and solve it, you know, create your own GitHub repo, write your code, um, show how you structure the problem. And so that gives me the idea of like, how do you think, how do you process a problem? How well do you code and document your code and things like that? And that's a good showpiece to have. Great advice. Um, there was also some, some really interesting questions. One of our uh, audience members was saying how passionate they are about teaching, that they're interested in an industry career, but they uh, also really you know, feel a very strong passion about wanting to teach. In your experience, are you aware of opportunities in an industry career where someone could still do that? I mean, Rock, I know that you're kind of straddling the academia industry kind of uh, border, so maybe you could lead lead off yeah yeah the, the company i took public um uh one of the in fact the, the the chief trainer uh for the company is um is one of my former phd students so so she got a phd with me and uh and she basically teaches customers how to how to use the product um and and has multiple people that are working with her to to uh to do the training and so you know especially in the medical field uh Training is extremely important for a product uh, because, you know, as, as a matter of fact, the regulatory burden on not properly training your pro your your customers is huge, and so especially in the medical physics field, training is really really important for their products. So that's an opportunity. Try uh, if, if you're a fourth year student, um, you know, try medical physics. You might like that as well. The other nice thing is that you would often uh, end up working instead of industry working as a clinical medical physicist and training uh, other staff other technicians for example in radiology or radiation oncology um, so uh, so take a look at medical physics i also was somebody who loved teaching i did a ton of work teaching in graduate school beyond like the ta work <coughs> I did, like i ran 
um, several of the TA training programs and, and things like that. So it was a really big kind of portion of, of what I did. One of the reasons I wanted to stay in academia. Um, I actually taught math at the community college right after graduate school in the evenings, just because I wanted to stay connected. Uh, that was a lot of work uh, on top of working a full-time job. So I might not necessarily recommend it, but it was kind of how I, how I got uh, scratched that itch at the time. I think as, you know, as I've kind of moved on in my career, when, as you move into kind of you know, more managerial roles, like there is that natural teaching element, you know, whether it's you know, the, directly the people on my team or whether it's my interns, maybe that has more of a mentorship as opposed to a teaching per se, um, but particularly in, in machine learning where you have people kind of coming in from a variety of different um, backgrounds. There's always this, I want to be able to take talent and say, okay, I can teach you, I can teach you the machine learning. If you have the capacity to learn and to do all the analysis, I can teach you these components. But then that kind of makes me have to pause and say, um, particularly in such a quickly evolving field, like what is the what is the body of work that I need to show them and, and get them familiar with to get them up to speed quickly. So you'll encounter teaching like scenarios um, all the time. Ophir, yes. Um. I guess I'm I'm an interesting spot there too. Like maybe a little plugging here for Raytheon is that, you know, I'm not there yet. Um, but I'm looking forward to um, you know, in order to become a research fellow here at Raytheon, that's part of the components is you have to teach. You have to have classes where you, I mean, here in El Segundo, you know, it's, uh, we build satellite stuff, we build optics, and uh, a lot of you know, it's and I've I've gone to the classes of, with some of the world experts who build these systems and who've been doing this for longer than I've been alive. And to me, it's, it's quite an honor to kind of work with these people who have been doing this for so long. And it's not maybe as like sexy in the sense of like, oh, it's this brand new thing, but there's definitely an element of know-how that man, there is a definite way, a definite method to the madness of how you properly design a system. And knowing people who've been doing this for a long time, and and learning from them, and and that's to have the expectation that you're gonna someday be put in that position to also teach others how to do this, that to me is quite rewarding because you know in the end that that's really cool is kind of passing the baton down and having the ability to learn and then having the expectation that you will have to, if you want to get to that point, <laughs> it will have to take on that role as well and teaching other younger engineers you know, how business is done so to say, <laughs> in, in that capacity. Yeah, you know, it is such an interesting thing too, because th this has come up even, even, you know, the lesson I always give to students is that there's so many different ways you can actually scratch your itch than you realize. Like if you enjoy teaching, like I love teaching as well. And in my role at, at APS in, as head of career programs, I mean, I am still teaching people as well. When I give a talk, when I go to um, schools and I'm answering questions, I'm teaching, I'm, I'm not teaching physics, I'm teaching career content, but there are lots of different ways that that particular uh, itch can be scratched. Um, and you find that out really from like talking to people and like doing informational interviews. Like the more people you can network with and talk with, the more you're gonna learn about those hidden hidden kind of qualities that these, these careers have. So I have, we don't have a lot of time, but this is one more question. And I do, I think it's very important. A lot of our attendees today are perhaps not US citizens. Um, a lot of APS's membership are not US citizens. Can you talk a little bit about, I know there are a lot of challenges with national labs, for example, in terms of employment, if, if a US citizen wanted to stay in the US. Can you talk a little bit about what picture is like in industry and, and give some advice to folks who are interested in pursuing industry careers in the US if they're a non-citizen? Oh, here, go ahead. Sure, I guess. I mean, maybe I opened up that door, uh, but but uh, I mean, it, th I'll start by saying that that's a, that's almost an entire talk in its own, because <laughs> that's a really there's a lot of moving parts of that. But maybe the the, the one thing I can say about that is, um, it's definitely getting harder than ever. Uh, I mean, that's kind of the reality. But uh, but at the same time, I remember when I was in that stage, you know. 17 years ago, uh, I thought the same thing too. Like, man, this looks impossible. Like, I don't know how am I ever gonna, if I'm gonna be able to get a job here or how do I even do this? And, you know, if there's a will, there's a way. I know that sounds cliche, but you just really have to be open and flexible 
as far as looking at what your options are and not thinking that you're going to have immediately what you want right away, especially if you're not a citizen. You have to work with the system. I'm not advocating for doing anything that's not legal, not even close. What I'm advocating for is doing the, the right way, but at the same time, recognizing what the limitations are. And because of that, finding the right opportunities that can then work as stepping stones so that you can, you know, so all of this may be a, a simplified way of saying what I'm saying is the, your first goal is, you know, find somebody who is willing to give you a job, who is willing to give you a chance so that you can get the paperwork that you need. Don't worry so much about, well, well if it's not this or that, then uh, like, we're not going to get very far that way. Especially now when, when, when there's so much, especially with H1 visas and, you know, uh, and how hard it is. It was hard to get him when I was, you know, 17 years ago trying to get one. I can't imagine now. I, I have, I've been disconnected from that process for a long time now. So I probably, I'm sure things have changed, but it was difficult back then. And uh, uh, the main thing is get the paperwork, get the opportunity so that you can get the paperwork and position yourself in a way where the paperwork works itself naturally instead of trying to fighting against that sort of uh, unfortunate but real limitation that exists. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a real, a, a really practical tip. Um, you can still be, uh, come a member, you can still be a member of the APS. Uh, there's lots of countries like Canada and the UK uh, where we're getting a visa uh, from say getting a PhD or master's is, uh, is welcomed uh, instead, of, uh, instead of difficult. So, so take a look at, at, uh, at postings outside of uh, the US um, in countries that you might want to want to live in. And I think it's interesting, three of the four of us on this panel are coming from outside. I'm from Canada originally. So, so there's great work environments in places other than America. Uh, but America is a wonderful place to have, your, have done your degree, even if they don't necessarily always want immigrants to stay. Um, and I would agree with, with, with offer that that uh, industry is probably still more willing to pay for the H-1B process than a, a small college. So uh, industry may be a better choice, even if you stay in the States. Yeah, Rock, that, that's a really great perspective. Um, you know, the APS OGA is doing all it can to kind of fight some of the, the, the policies that are being rolled out right now, but it is tough. Um, I will also just quickly plug, <laughs> Uh, and we're out of time, unfortunately, but I, I will just mention that um, in the summer, starting in May of 2021, we're going to be holding a webinar series that's specifically targeted its professional development for for non US citizens. Um, so we're, you know, keep an eye out for that. Um, if you go to sign up for our webinar list, uh, you can check the box to, to receive notifications about that. Um, Folks, I, I hate to say it, there are still like a dozen or more really, really excellent questions, but we do, that is all the time we have for our official webinar. Um, you can send an email to webinars at APS.org and we can forward the questions for comment. Um, I also will remind you that this was recorded and all of you will receive a email, uh, probably in about 48 hours with the video recording. Um, so please keep an eye out for that. And as you leave today, there will be a survey. If you could take a few moments to just give us some feedback on this, we would be really, really appreciative. Um, and that wraps it up. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you, everybody. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Thank you, everyone. Yep. All right. Uh, American Physical Society, copyright 2020, all rights reserved. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care.